Well, good morning, church. Trust you had a very festive Thanksgiving, and wow, doesn't our sanctuary look beautiful? I think Janice, did you have a big hand in the decor? Janice and Gerald? Well, it is absolutely beautiful, but I have to be honest with you. I did not think any of us would be here this morning. I knew for sure when I went to bed last night we were all going to be raptured. You know why? Because Texas A&M won a football game. I am shocked. Sorry, Doug. <laughs> well, recently, this Thanksgiving holiday, uh, a reporter in Arkansas asked the governor what he was most thankful for. And he said, I'll tell you, I'm most thankful to be part of a great state that is the first and only state to be mentioned in the Bible. And to further prove his point, he opened his Bible to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 13, and he read, And Noah looked out of the ark and saw the ground was dry. <laughs> Bless his heart. At least Arkansas has one thing they can be thankful for. Well, I trust you had a very festive Thanksgiving, and I'm glad I could look out today and see you here. And for those of you who are worshiping online, uh, we're glad you're along with us as well. We do have a few announcements. Uh, if you are visiting with us today, uh, we're very glad to have you here. We do have visitor cards in each of our foyer areas. If you wouldn't mind giving us a little information uh, about yourself, uh, we can add you to our email list and get you additional information about the church and our times of worship and other gatherings that we have uh, during the week. Uh, we also do have printed announcements, and we have our announcements online as well on our website. There's a few I want to bring attention to. First and foremost is we are having a breakfast Immediately following uh, this worship service, we are having a Mary's Taco Fiesta, and Pam managed to get my favorite Mary's Taco, the Macho Sean, because I am a macho, macho man, and I like to eat. The Macho Sean. Okay, aren't you glad you came to church this morning? <laughs> For <laughs> further announcements. Uh, if you don't have one of these, we have them out in the foyer areas, or you can go online. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, Rick DeLong's class, I guess, will not be meeting because it has no class among the... I would never say that Rick DeLong or any of his members have no class, but apparently they <laughs> will not have class. So I just want to clarify that. If you see that and it says no class, that's not a personal attack. Uh, also, uh, we, for our next Singles and Widows Gathering... We are going to have a white elephant gift exchange. So hopefully you're familiar with the white elephant gift exchange. If not, we do have details on our announcements. So just what we ask, we don't want you to go buy anything, but you can bring something from around the house or something you've never used or something you just want to get rid of. We just ask that it be something that could be used by a male or female, so a unisex gift, uh, that will be wrapped, and then we will exchange those. That's going to take place Saturday, December 10th, at the home of Richie and Anita Curtis. Well, that's my house. Um, that's 148 Latigo Lane from 3 p.m. till 5 p.m. We will have desserts and all kinds of fun and festivities from 3 to 5 at Casa Curtis. That's for all of our singles and widows. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at that time. Also, the uh, Hill Country Pregnancy Care Center uh, has an urgent need for fall and winter baby and toddler clothes, all sizes up to 5T. Uh, we do have a basket to collect clothes in the fellowship hall. Uh, you can also drop off any donations directly at the Hill Country Pregnancy Center, and there are other details if you have questions as well uh, on the announcement form. We have flyers out in the foyer uh, if you would like uh, further information of how you can donate to that cause. We also are thankful for uh, your giving. Uh, your giving uh, helps us to support uh, many ministries uh, worldwide, some of which you've had a chance to uh, hear of recently as we've had speakers come in uh, to share. Uh, we'll also have more of that so you can hear more of how your money is supporting missions worldwide uh, as well as locally. So we do have uh, offering boxes in each of our foyer areas. You can also mail in your offerings as well as give online. As we prepare for our time of communion, um, 
we are wrapping up what is unarguably the busiest travel season of the year in Thanksgiving. And many of you have uh, braved uh, the wet roadways, some Texas on them, uh, Texans on them over the last few days. Some of you may have gone through airports uh, with planes that have either been severely delayed or flights that were canceled altogether. Traveling today is not easy, and I haven't even mentioned the high gas prices. So why is it that we do that? Why do we pack the trunks to where they're ready to pop and we brave the perils of flight? The answer is pretty simple. We love being with those that we love. And I'll let you in on a little secret. So does God. There was a great distance that separated us from God, the distance of sin. And God couldn't stand to be apart from us. He could not bear to be apart from you. And so he decided he would bridge that distance. And he came from heaven to earth to be among us. And not only to be among us, but to live as one of us, to go through each and everything that any of us would ever go through and then some. Philippians 2.7 puts it this way. It says, he gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. And having even made himself nothing, he still had to count in full what his love would cost. And having done that, he still decided to go the, the final mile between us and heaven so that not a one of us would be lost. Let me ask you this. Were it not for grace, where would any of us be? Wandering down a pointless road to nowhere, forever running, but losing the race. Were it not for grace? And that's something we can all be thankful for this morning. And so we remember that now in a tangible way as we come to the table and we remember the ultimate sacrifice of Christ, his love, the one whose blood did pour so that we may live in and with him today, tomorrow, and forevermore. It was on that day that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this bread represents my body broken for you, take and eat. And as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took the cup, and he said, This represents my blood, which will be shed for you. Take and drink, and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. And all God's people said, Amen. And so be it. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, we've been recognizing different teachers that have been contributing and serving our body. And um, today we wanted to uh, recognize Doug Hess. He didn't know that, but uh, he might not have shown up if I had told him in advance. But um, Doug, why don't you come up here? Doug is teaching a Sunday school class over here. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, they just Philippians? Philippians, Philippians. so, but here's a gift card so that you can um, you. take Becky out to a nice place, uh, Becky, uh, you know, your wife, uh, uh, this is a real restaurant, uh, yeah, it's not like uh, where you usually take her, uh, Whataburger, <laughs> anyways. We appreciate the time and effort that Doug puts into preparing for the class um, every week. Um, and so thank you for, thank for you. being faithful to that. Well, I uh, too hope that each of you had a wonderful um, time during Thanksgiving and um, we, uh, we certainly did. I think we celebrated it twice um, just because of coordinating with uh, kids and grandkids 
And um, I think last Saturday we had it with Katie and the granddaughters, and then um, she had to go back to duty because the Army says that you have to work on holidays, goofy thing. Um, and um, then uh, we went up to Austin, and it was just great because it's a different dynamic, right? Because uh, we have two little grandsons up there, uh, almost six and almost one, and it's just it's just great. You know, you just watch watch those kids running around and the parents, and it's just a blast. I just think, oh Lord, thank you for grandkids. It's it's the best payback there is available. Because <laughs> they had decorated the tree, and man, you know, the the little one, man, he's running around and he's thinks that those trees are balls. It's great. It's great. Loved it. Every bit of it. So in Galatians, um, we're, we're entering into chapter number two. And, you know, I, last week we looked at how God is to be glorified by his transforming power. Um, I had a lot of time to think and pray throughout the week um, and at one time I was just doing one of my silent prayer moments where I spent 30, 40 minutes just trying to hear and listening um, to God speak. And the idea came back to me is that, that we have made a huge mistake in thinking that the gospel is only in the beginning. Like we preach the gospel. We go and we share that Christ has been crucified and risen again. And then we've got our ticket to heaven, and then we go on with life until we go to heaven. But it hit me so powerfully was that, no, we need the gospel every day. Because certainly we need to know that he died, he became sin for us, and that he rose again. But every day of our lives, we need to remember that I have resurrection life now. That it's more than just going to heaven when I die. I need that life. And when we, we get to the focus on men instead of Christ, when we think of the gospel as a one-time event and not a daily event, we miss out on the transforming power of God in our lives. And so we see that Paul had this magnificent transformation, but... That should be the hunger for each and every one of us to experience that transforming power in our, la uh, in our lives moment by moment. So let's read the first four verses. He said, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, uh, though privately before those who seemed influential. The gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. Well, Father, I pray that my prayer would be answered, that your word would go forth, not with eloquence, but a moving of your spirit that brings about transformation in our lives. And I pray that we would each have an ear to hear, hearts to respond, and that you would move upon us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So you, as we're going through Galatians, at the first part, you, you're, you're noticing that Paul is establishing his authority. And I thought it would be important for us to go and look at Acts and see the context of what was going on when Paul was bringing this Galatians message because he had to establish his authority because he had these Judaizers who were coming back behind him trying to add to the gospel, trying to add to, to, to Jesus. And the main thing that they were wanting to enforce was that you had to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. 
He had to receive circumcision in order to be saved. So when Christ rose again, he gave, he, he spent that 40 days with the disciples, and right before he ascends into heaven, what did he do? He gave them the Great Commission. He says, go into all the world. And what did they do? They hunkered down in Jerusalem. And then Paul, in his Judaism, right, he gets excited about getting rid of this, this uh, horrible sect and tries to destroy him, and then they scatter out to the uh, outer regions. And here, he's, this is the very place that Paul ends up going back to, to reach these very people. So in Acts 11, verse 25 and 26, he says, So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, in Jerusalem, the Jews were staying pretty much stuck there because they had this horrible prejudice. They thought all the Gentiles were filthy dogs. They just couldn't bring themselves to imagine that God would be interested in any other people. And so Paul had, Saul and Paul were inter using his Greek and, and, and Hebrew name, right? He, he's like been taught by the Lord for three years, and he's just kind of sitting out there. And Barnabas, who his name means the son of compassion, this was a name that was assigned him. The guy who was full of compassion. And he's, he's there. He's been sent to Antioch to see what's going on here and to get the church centered on a solid foundation. And he goes, you know what would be really good for this? Saul. And he runs out and he gets Saul. And Saul comes back and he begins. And they're teaching there together for a whole year. You see, Barnabas was he understood that Saul was gifted for ministry. And even though no one would touch him, he had compassion. And I thought, well, that's such a powerful thing. Barnabas takes him into the church, even when the church wasn't ready to receive him. Barnabas reaches out to him in Antioch, knowing that he had something to give the body. And he uses that compassion and brings them out. And they become the team that was most suited and gifted to begin to take the gospel into the outer regions. So then in Acts chapter 13, verse 1 and 3, he says, now there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, and Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of the Cyrene, and Manon, the lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now look at verse 2. He says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. First, I want you to see, here was the church and they were living in such a community that they were worshiping and fasting. Now, we think worship is about how well we sing. And there's nothing wrong with singing praise and worship. But the art of worship is not just singing songs that we like or having a band that we prefer and listening. Worship is our surrender are bowing down to him, and they were fasting. And what happened? They heard God. Now, when, we, they, when we, we hear people say, well, God spoke to me, uh, well, it's not usually an audible voice, although it could be. Usually, it's an inner hearing. You say, well, why were they fasting? Were they trying to get right with God? no. They were fasting simply to have all of their attention focused on him. Now, many of you just came out of the, uh, the, the Thanksgiving carb coma, right? Like, that's what happens, right? What, you eat that big meal, and all of a sudden, you have to take a nap. You cannot focus on anything 
because your body is full and all that stuff is turned into sugar and whatever, and you're like, <laughs> or at least that's me. Now, the fasting wasn't to make themselves right with God. The fasting wasn't about um, coming to a place where God would hear them. The fasting wasn't somehow adding to their acceptance. The fasting was just a way for them to laser focus on hearing what God wanted. And so all of us need to have these times in our lives or moments in our day where we're doing nothing, we're not eating, we're just simply trying to hear what God wants to do in and through us. Do you hear God? Do you hear him speaking? They get this and the Holy Spirit says, listen, I want you to set apart Paul and Barnabas. And so what do they do? They go, oh, let's go get confirmation. So they fasted and they prayed. And they got confirmation and they sent them out. They led, laid hands on them and said, so Antioch and not Jerusalem has become the center of the missionary movement because it was free from all of the racial prejudice that the Jewish people had been blinded by. They went by the leading of the Holy Spirit and they preached the gospel and they saw incredible results because God is the one who builds his church. And when they had completed what they had been called to, they returned to their sending church. He says in Galatians, he says, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem and Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. So now they've done this missionary journey. They fulfilled the, the calling of the spirit, but they've been having this problem everywhere they go. And that's these Judaizers trying to come in behind them, creating confusion in the church. They come in with the gospel. Jesus plus nothing is everything for Jew and for Gentile. He paid it all. And they're coming back. Yeah, but. Uh, Jesus, but plus circumcision, and Jesus plus holy days, and Jesus plus, and so they're stuck. What do they do? It seems to fit perfectly in the timeline with what we see happen in Acts chapter 15, because you see they had Titus with them, and Titus was a convert on that first journey. So in Acts 15, 1 and 2, it says, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders about this question. You see, there are some things that are worth fighting for in the church. I mean, we all have different opinions about different things. But there's, the purity of the gospel is worth fighting for. So here are these people, and they're trying to add to it. And they say, no, we, we had no small dissension. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like. I've been in some elders meetings like that, I think. No, no small dissension. Whew. Um, he says, but I went up by revelation. So I'm sitting there in my office one day, and I, was, I don't know, Vanessa was gone somewhere doing something. Um, it was just me, and the dogs were sleeping. And uh, I was like, Lord, because there's some th things going on. I'm like, what's going on here? What's going on here? And I love those moments when he speaks into my life. Because there's times when you're confused. I mean, if you're serious about your walk, there's times when you're living in this world and you're confused. And, that, and he showed me that picture was that, you know, in Exodus when the Jews are coming out, Right there in 34, I preached on that verse a couple weeks ago a little bit, that God is a jealous God. You know, he gave them instructions. He says, break down all of their altars, break down all of their poles and all of their places of worship. 
And the, the hindrance to the revelation that we have is that many of us still have many altars that we worship at. The reason we're not hearing from God is one, we don't listen. And secondly, we are worshiping so many other things. We worship fame. We worship wealth. We worship all kinds of possessions and desires. And then we say, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied. I got my ticket to heaven. And I'm not really worried about experiencing transformation because I'm pretty settled with where I'm at. And everybody else better just learn to live with it. But he's saying, listen, I have so much more for you. I want each and every one of us to come to a place where we can get so quiet with God that we can hear what he wants to do in and through us, that we are living in a responsive relationship with him, that we have and sense the impulse of what God wants to do and how he wants to give and how he wants to speak through every one of us. The Holy Spirit made it clear to Paul and the church leadership that a delegation was to go to Jerusalem where the problem originated. But you know, friends, don't think this is a first century thing. God wants to speak into your heart. God wants to direct your life. God wants to bring revelation to you and understanding. He wants you to continue to experience transformation and set before them though privately before those who seemed influential the gospel that i proclaim among the gentiles in order to make sure i was not running or had not run in vain so paul who's the leader of this missionary team he presents the gospel of grace as opposed to the works righteousness that was being taught by the judaizers and he did this out of respect for biblical authority. And I like how it says, and he did it privately. You know, there's, there, the Bible gives us ways of handling questions and problems. And it's almost always never on the internet. <laughs> right? Well, it was on the internet. It must be true. <laughs> but he say, listen, in, in, in the church community, we have a way of discussing and solving problems, and it's privately with the leadership. And so he, they, they come and they say, listen, we're preaching the gospel of grace. You who are apostles, do you recognize this as an authentic, true gospel? Do you align with it, or are you saying Jesus plus? And I started thinking, you know, First century problems, 21st century problems, same. Because all through the church is infected a mixed gospel. A gospel that says, come to Jesus, pray this prayer, and you get your ticket to heaven, and then you need to do this. And every group has their own list of things you got to do. Some churches, you got to wear a tie like Richie. Richie no tie today but a jacket at least you know your sunday best man you're meeting the lord you've got to wear a jacket i wish i had one um some churches say man uh you you, you get saved by grace and then through discipline and uh, spiritual um, practices then you become sanctified of course uh you've never really there and then some people say, well, man, every Sunday you got to get right with God because you might have sinned or had a bad thought or been tempted through the week. Now, I've been there before, man. Man, we're wearing out. We had the altar, we had the carpet and the steps, and, man, we'd be flooding it. And you had to go sometimes because the preacher wouldn't stop until pe enough people went forward. Man, sometimes I'd just go like, hey, i got to get out of here, man. Let's go forward and get right. And then... And in, in some places, it's, it's Jesus plus tithing. In some places, it was, it's Jesus plus you got to get baptized. And then in some, see, you see what I'm saying? Without really realizing it, we, we've, we've accepted a mixed gospel here in America because it's Jesus plus. Now, 
Should we get baptized? Absolutely. It's a wonderful identification. It's important. Should we give sacrificially? Yes, but it doesn't make us right. It's an outflow of joy, not a law. Should we, should we walk yielded to experience the sanctification ever seeing, Lord, Lord, that doesn't suit you. That needs to go, yes. But it all flows from an indwelling truth. I want my heart to be yielded and tender and responsive. But there's nothing I can do to add to or improve to the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Are there great works that he has for each of us to do? We talked about it last week. Absolutely. But none of them improve on what Jesus did. They just set me free from my narcissistic passions. Just me, not the rest of you. The authentic gospel of grace is justification by faith alone. And so he comes, Paul and Barnabas, and they've given their lives to, for the Gentiles to hear the gospel of grace. They suffer greatly in this pursuit. And he uses the picture of those who run a race together, and he desperately wanted to make sure there was no division but unity. So in Acts 15, 12, we see in all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. See, God was moving. God was building his church. He was taking the gospel where they had no knowledge. They had never heard. And the Jews were stuck with this prejudice against all Gentiles. They're sitting there thinking, I mean, how could God be interested in bringing Gentiles to themselves? They'd have to first become like us. They didn't care about the miracles and the working of the Holy Spirit. They didn't see these things as authenticating signs. See, Paul wasn't the first to preach to the Gentiles. Remember Peter? Think about how stubborn this is. Think how stubborn we can be. Here's Peter. I mean, he's been through it all, right? I mean, he's there with Jesus. I will never deny you. All of these will deny you. Then he denies, and he's broken. Let's go fishing, which was a complete failure until Jesus shows up, and then Jesus calls him back into ministry, and now he's boldly proclaiming, and he's still stuck. No, not Gentiles. He had to have this vision where the sheet comes down with all kinds of really good stuff like bacon and lobster and <laughs> shrimp and who knows what else was on that thing. And P still Peter's like, no, mm -mm. no, I'm a good Jew. I ain't touching that stuff. I ain't eating that food. And the spirit says, don't call unclean what I call clean. And he goes and preaches the gospel to Cornelius, a Roman soldier. And now Paul comes and Peter's like, yep, mm-hmm. You see, we all can struggle with how could, good, how could God desire those people? They're just no good. See, in your mind, who are those people that God could not love because they're no good? And let me tell you what it exposes about us. We're believing the lie that the gospel's for good people. And God chose us because we're good. See, how could he love those people? I, I mean, I get it, how he could love me. I mean, why not? No, he's saying, the gospel is good news for all the bad people in the world, and you're not good. You're delusional. And so the Jewish people, thinking of themselves as good, didn't want anyone else in. They had to become like them. 
But that's the great tragedy. God didn't want them to become like them. He wanted to bring about his own transformation, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was Greek. So Titus was a Gentile, and his standing as a faithful Christian was perceived apart from Jewish circumcision. See, circumcision was the seal of the old covenant. But what is the seal of the new covenant? A circumcision of the heart. You see, God always cared more about the heart than any picture or symbol. In Colossians 2.11, it says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. When we were born into the world, we were tied to the old man, the sinful nature. We couldn't cut that out. But he says, by faith, through grace, when we entrust ourselves to the finished work, he says, I'm going to separate you from that old man. I'm going to separate. I'm going to cut you free. So that now we're free to be all that he wants us to be. He says, yet because a false brother secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. Isn't it amazing? So here we have this idea that there are false brethren. The false brethren wanted to alter the gospel of grace. And as I said earlier, there are those today who want to add performance to the gospel of grace. The false brethren were pseudo-Christians. They were tares amongst the wheat. They wanted to sabotage the gospel by requiring religious performance. Our liberty in Christ frees us from all works for acceptance with God. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that you or I could do to improve on what Jesus has done. The Greek word means to enslave completely. But this is what you got to understand about false brethren. They don't look like wolves. They look like sheep. The false brethren manifest in different ways. They always add something. And the purpose is to enslave. You see, if I can put you on a treadmill of performing so that you can evaluate yourself to being better, I've got you. Because once it's about you, you're a slave. In very subtle ways. In very legalistic churches, we get, we're enslaved. We're worn out. We're tired because you can never do enough to get right with God. Because the enemy is always haunting you and reminding you of some failure, past and present. Sometimes the false brethren manifest by enticing you to love the world and the things of the world. You say, yeah, but that's a big, great ministry, and they preach the word. They preach some of it. But if you see in the leadership a love for money and fame and the things of the world, you should be concerned. Because they're adding something to it. 
They're building altars for you to worship at that are false gods. And you've got to decide to break those down, every single last one of them. Because that interferes with our revelation, our intimacy with the Creator. It doesn't do anything to improve your standing with Him. It does everything to improve the experience of intimacy with your Creator. In Acts 15, 10, he says, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? You see, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard preachers do this all the time. I go, well, we don't, we don't follow these laws, but we do follow these laws. But the law isn't split up where you can pick and choose which ones you're going to follow. You say circumcision is part of it? We got to have that? Well, you got to take the whole bundle. The reason we're, but, but don't misunderstand it because have you guys ever heard of this word antinomianists? Well, I've been called an antinomianist, which I take as a compliment. But it means they mean it as a negative because they're saying you're against the law. We're not against the law, the law is good and perfect. Holy representation. I'm not anti-against. I'm anti in the Greek can be against or instead of. I'm instead of the law. You see, the thing is, is I'm not saying that we're lawless people because we're not lawless people. But we are a people who live in a responsive relationship with the indwelling presence. And we know that the Holy Spirit in us is never going to lead us in a way that is contrary to any expression of the moral law of God. But once you make an external rules, you're a slave. God is interested in the heart, and he wants to reveal himself to you. The gospel of grace is always an offense to the self-righteous. Always. And the reason it's an offense to the self-righteous is because the self-righteousness is about what? Well, me. I don't. I do. And what's the source? I. I. And I'm better because I'm one of the good people. And so you come in and say, man, it's just the grace of God and the gospel is today and it's tomorrow and it's every day. Well, they're like, no, that's offensive because it needs to be about me now. And I'm good. And I'm getting more gooder all the time. For all you English people, I just did that to be nice. <clears throat> Legalism is defined by adding human performance to the finished work of the cross. People say, well, I'm not a legalist. I don't think you can do anything to get saved. I'm saying, okay, so once you're saved, is there anything I can do to add or improve upon? And if they say, yeah, well, you got to do this, and you got to read your Bible, and you got to pray for 30 minutes, and you gotta, you got to witness to 10 people a week, and you got to tithe on your gross income, and you, and you got to give offerings above that, and you got to, and you got to, and you got to, and you got to, and you got to. Well, that's legalism. I'm saying God's got something way better than a law. He's got his life in you. To bring revelation, to guide you, to speak to you, to take you where he wants to take you, to speak through you the way he wants to speak through you, to transform you and liberate you from all that's held you in bondage. 
and yet we must resist all attempts to enslave the believer by adding to, it is finished. Because it can't be finished and there's something you have to do. It can't be both. You are free. But freedom isn't doing whatever you want. Freedom is you entering to the experience to be all that God has for you. That's freedom. Father, only you can build your church and only you can do the work of transformation. Only you can open our eyes, unplug our ears. Lord, stir within us a passion for our King and your kingdom. We ask in Jesus' name. Hey, y'all stand up and I'll pray a blessing on you. <laughs> Father, as you live in us, would you reveal if there's any altars that need to be broken down? There's any lies that we're believing? Anything that's hindering our experiencing your speaking into us, bringing revelation to us, and living your life through us. Lord, this is our hunger, our passion, our great desire. Let it be, Lord Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.